Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show about Manchester United, the great Manchester United. And it's part of the 90 Min Podcast Network as well. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett as ever, as Man United win again, Rob. Leicester beaten 3 0 at Old Trafford. And this week ahead is a big one. You've got a potentially, it could be, I think I referred to it as it could be one of those nights at Old Trafford on Thursday night. And then there's a cup final to look forward to on Sunday. And I tell you what, Nick Pope should play in that game, shouldn't he? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I think when you look at this kind of this coming up with the Barcelona game, this feels like the old days. You know what I mean? When you've got a big team coming to Old Trafford and you've got two or three days to prepare mentally for it and it feels all very exciting. So we're going to try and convey some of that excitement today here about the game and obviously you're going to the game Scott I'm not for once which is a kind of surprise one for me but I can't go um, so that's just the way it goes so I will be watching from afar and you can let us know on the following day on the promised land what the atmosphere was like and whether Manchester United was successful in their opportunity to beat a team like Barcelona yep I'm also trying to get into the final at Wembley on Sunday as well so we'll see um but yeah, we'll talk today about the Barcelona game because that's the immediate concern for Eric Ten Hag and for Manchester United, who are starting to show a bit of flexibility. They're getting players coming back to fitness. Uh, suspensions are being lifted after Lisandro Martinez and Marcel Sabitzer have served their one-match bans in the first leg against Barcelona. Both of them will be back. Anthony Martial... Is he ever going to be fit? I don't know, but he can't be too far away. Anthony, Eric Ten Ten Hag said last week, was close. Uh, And things are looking all right. It's only really Christian Eriksen at the moment who is a long-term injury concern. Scott McTominay's back in the squad. So United are having... If you look at their squad in general, I know like people have looked at it in the past and gone, well, that's not very good, is it? It can't really compete. But if you look at it when everyone's fit, actually quite kind of big, quite experienced... And we'll talk about that later and what maybe it could, what we could maybe see on Thursday night and what it could mean for the rest of the season. But we'll talk Jaden Sancho as well. But we will look ahead to Barcelona. Do you want to look back at Leicester briefly at all? Mm. It's not on the agenda, but uh, the second half performance was brilliant. And the first half, eh, lucky? I don't know. Is that the right word? Maybe that I know Harry will behind the camera definitely say that Marcel Sabitz had got sent off, but should have got sent off. But how did you what did you make of it, Rob? You were there for that. Yeah, I, I thought first half average, not a disaster. I think Leicester were obviously the better team and had chances to put the ball in the back of the net. And David De Gea was in full superhero mode of making these saves and kind of keeping United in the game. But I think the big difference, Scott, now is that at half time, and I said this to people around me. I went, I trust Ten Hag to take the boys into the dressing room and sort it out and come out and fix it. Now, I've never really said that <laughs> at all. Going back over time with previous United managers, you always just felt terrible at half time because they'd been terrible in the first half. But there's always this feeling now that Eric Ten Hag is inside these players' heads and he can tweak stuff and fix it. And that's exactly what happened. United came out in the second half and were three goals better than Leicester. Like, very much so. Do you know what I mean? When you went through the game... They at the end of the result, it felt like a, a 3 0 performance, and it I think felt they like had an XG. I love <coughs> XG, an XG of over four. I, I saw the XG after the game, and I was just like, my eyes popping out my head because I was like, that shows, I think, all of those actions in the final third that's starting to add up. That's why you're winning games because you're a better team in the final third, but you're also. Better in midfield, in transition. You're better from back to front. You're better from the out ball from the centre-backs. Your full-backs are more progressive. That means your XG goes up. That's why we look at XG. So the XG worked today when you looked at the actual result. Manchester United deserved their victory. But it was really, really good. I'm going to say on the Sabitzer one. So I put my two oars in it here as as a journalist and not a football fan. It's not a red card. It's not (laughs) It's not excessive force. It's not excessive force. And it's quite clear from the replay that he kind of, he puts his foot up. It's a graze. It's a graze. Yeah, he's not trying to make contact with the player. There's no deliberacy in there. And, And he's almost pulling out of it in the last second. So I think the replay substantiates that. In real time, if the referee had sent him off in real time, I don't think it gets overturned either. 
because of the height of the challenge. So there's nothing in the rule book that talks about height. Nothing. It's about danger. So it was high. And you, and I think if he'd really made contact with him hard, even if he doesn't mean it, it's red because it's dangerous and it's and then it's violent conduct. That's kind of what, how it's kind of worked out. Um, but other than that, I think the replay shows that he wasn't violent and wasn't excessive. And they're, they're the two kind of barometers for whether someone gets sent off or not. Man United are five points behind Arsenal, who have a game in hand. And incidentally, Arsenal play Leicester away this weekend. Tough game. Tough game. Difficult. Very Leicester tough. made it difficult in the first half for United as well and beat Spurs comfortably the weekend before. Title race. Whisper. Whisper it. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll come to it later. Eric Ten Hag doesn't want to talk about title races <laughs> until April. But I think Arsenal play three games before United play next. I don't want to talk about title races till April as well, so we'll go with the boss. If the boss says that, I'm happy with that. I definitely tweeted that United are in a title race, though. (laughs) I think you did. uh, I think we did a show about it as well at one point. Yeah, we did. Well, we will do many more. (laughs) Uh, United's next game is at Anfield in the league. Uh, But yes, I'm talking about tweeting. You can follow us on Twitter at underscore Scott Saunders for me, at underscore Rob underscore B for Rob, and at Promise and MU for the show. Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast as well on all your major podcast platforms. We do the show twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays. We're also on YouTube. The Promise and Manchester United podcast is what you can search. Subscribe to that channel. Like this video. Leave a comment for us as well. Uh, and join the community with us. And we'll be doing more shows. And it's much more fun to do shows when Man United are playing well rather than being awful, which is I think most of this time that we've done this podcast, Rob, United have been really crap. Uh, yeah, I, th- I said, I think the minute I became a journalist 11 years ago, that I- I've literally then spent 11 years reporting that Man United are terrible, which is like <laughs> before that, when I was just a fan, I was like enjoying it and it was lovely and you could have the bragging rights. So maybe we are turning a little bit of a corner. That's why I'm quite patient about it. It's just nice, isn't it? To see kind of sunnier skies with our football team than maybe all the grey clouds that we've had for so many years. There's plenty of takeover talk, but we're just going to park that today. Uh, We'll just look at the Barcelona game. Barcelona visit Old Trafford Thursday night, 8 p.m. UK time, under the lights. I think it's going to be quite noisy. Barcelona lack missing Pedri and Gavi, might have Busquets back. But United gave them a bit of a scare in the first leg. They didn't didn't shy away. They really gave it a go. 2-2 on aggregate. Mm. And United just need to win. On the night. Uh, gut feeling, Rob, do you think United can do it? Of course. Yeah, I do. And and the thing is, the reason why I say that is, again, just looking at it from a logical aspect, is that confidence is on the rise, isn't it? And you can, you're can you looking at each game where Man United are stage managing themselves, that even in moments of adversity, they're finding ways. Now, the bits that you said at the top of the show are really, really key. Barcelona are losing players in terms of, you know, due to fitness, suspension, one thing or another. Manchester United are bringing them ones back. We saw in the Camp Nou, didn't we, that United can certainly compete with this Barcelona team, you know, in in kind of armed combat one-on-one. If they're coming to Old Trafford, I think they're probably going to have to do some things that they don't like doing as a team, where Man United can actually be more of themselves. They can actually play and dictate the match a little bit more. Um, When you look at, your availability, the whole thing about Christian Eriksen, and you said that there, is that I still think Man United have an issue with ball progression, but I was saying the last few games, not as big as an issue. It seems to be they're finding methods to get the ball through the middle of the park and into into more dangerous areas. And they're doing it because they're getting one or two ball players back. I think the big player there, of course, is Jaden Sancho, who I think is probably the ultimate ball player in this team. But we've not seen enough yet to kind of judge Jaden. But I think you said about the Leicester game, I thought when he came on, he changed the game. He was sensational. He looked like one of those caged footballers playing this football in Croydon in South London somewhere. Yeah, flicking and doing little tricks and just working in such tiny spaces. Whereas you look at United players from the past, they couldn't really work in spaces like this big, could they? So Jaden doing that for us, I think that's almost a little bit of a secret weapon for Ten Hag in this Barcelona match. So Jaden Sancho came in as the ten. Uh, mm. Bruno Fernandes on the right as Ten Hag is seeming to favour quite a bit and me yeah did you say all, all along you wanted Bruno on the right 
Or did I do I recall us having a conversation? I've been doing, con- con- <laughs> I've been doing content for weeks about Bruno on the right, Scott. You've got to watch my stuff. What about months ago? <laughs> I, 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 this, for me, I said before, right, and 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 I'll touch on this. Bruno, I don't think is brilliant in the wider areas. I don't think he's a, a wide player per se, because we were thinking wide players have to be able to dribble, get past the last man. What you can see with Bruno Fernandez is can you mitigate his weaknesses in the middle and still make him really, really valid in a football match? And I think the way you do that is from the right-hand side of an attack. I think when he's in the middle and has to be a midfielder, that's when Bruno loses the ball. That's when I get on my high horse to start banging the drum about Bruno Fernandes losing the ball. On the right-hand side, it's not as much of an issue. It really isn't. Jaden Sancho playing the 10, Scott, and even Big Vout playing the 10, is much more economy from number 10 in terms of keeping the ball. So I'm all for that. So Bruno on the right. I think for now, that's the right way to go. And you can rotate him and Anthony, can't you? Give you different different kinds of skill bases on the right-hand side of your attack. I'd rather have him there than Jaden. Now, people would say put Jaden on the right because that's where he played for Dortmund. I'm like, no, nah, maybe play Jaden through the middle, give him freedom because he's a better player on the ball, but then let Bruno run the game from the right-hand side a little bit more. You know, he, That's why that XG, I think, was so good, Scott, against Leicester because the balance of the attack was beautiful. Two assists for Bruno Fernandes from the right. Mm. He picked up Marcus Rashford for the first goal. Mm-hmm. Played a one-two with Sancho for the second. By the way, that finish with his left foot was just really aesthetically pleasing. Uh, well, I don't know if that op- was really picked up. The opening up. I, 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 yeah. Uh, do you know no, what? I haven't really seen anyone talk about that. I know. It's weird, isn't it? Like, it felt good in real time. It was right in front of us. And, and you saw him kind of the one-two and kind of make the run. And the ball ended up so quickly in the net. And I remember thinking to myself, how, how did he do that? How did he yeah. put it, the ball in that part of the net from that angle at that pace? And as you said, the replay shows just the finish is world class. It's an actually world class finish, opening his body up and just flicking the ball into an area where he passes the ball into net. That's cage football. That's what they do in South London, the boys. None of it is all about hitting the ball hard. It's all about precision. He's a precision player. I think that's a really nice link up from number 10. And it was a really nice finish. Yeah, it's obviously we've... <laughs> We went a few months without really talking about Sancho because he has had not so well publicized, but I think everyone can kind of understand like the reasons why he was out of the team. Uh, yeah. The issues don't need to be in the public domain, obviously. Um, but he needed time away, physically, mentally, to come back looking like the player I'm suggesting we're starting to see. Because we all know at Borussia Dortmund just how good this lad was. We all know why Man United spent two years trying to sign him. It's not worked for him so far. Uh, you know, you have Marcus Rashford, who has now shown his, pro- his best position is probably from the left, drifting in. Sancho's preferred position has been generally from the left, although I think it's quite beneficial to have the flexibility and the keeping the opponents guessing when Veghorst can come in as the 10 and then go up front and then Rashford yeah. goes left and Sancho comes into the 10 and this kind of thing. It's, it's good to have that unpredictability. Uh, but on Sancho's case, I mean, we were talking a few months ago about when Marcus Rashford was starting to really gain some momentum. How does Sancho get back in the team? Mm. Because we look at him as a, a left winger. How does he get back in the team? Turns out, Eric Ten Hag has a plan. And do you think, with Barcelona on the horizon, that he will go back to Sancho as the 10 from the start? Potentially, it, it's not a guarantee. Uh, and I think, again, with Eric Ten Hag, he's a holistic coach. He thinks about the 11. How does the 11 work together? So I think this is why when he makes changes, he's kind of very precision, isn't he? I kind of called him a surgeon before. You know, he's with his scalpel. He looks at the finer details. And I think that's maybe what, say, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wasn't particularly good at, you know, wasn't good at the fine details of the game, was a bit more kind of, you know, huff and bluster. Um, I think with Jadon Sancho at the 10, I think we will definitely see it more and more. I think we will see more of a movement to see of Veghorst maybe starting as the 10 and Jadon either on the bench and then you change it or you start Veghorst further up the pitch as the nine, as the pressing point. And, and uh, Ten Hag did say after the game and made a big point of it, he was like, we were a better team when I had the striker pressing. Now, that wasn't a dig at Rashford. It really wasn't. But he was just kind of saying the shape was better. The fluidity was better. Um, I think Jaden Sancho, I said before, I think even at the start of the season, 
that we have never seen Jaden as a 10, so we don't know if it works or not. So we can't say he must play number 10. However, I think in this small window, we are seeing that he's got freedom in there and he's got supreme ball control and he can move the ball. So I think he's a better long-term number 10 than Bruno in many ways. doesn't mean that he'll score as many goals as Bruno, but Sancho has definitely got the potential, Scott. We saw it in the, in the Bundesliga to be either a goal or an assist a game player. So he can do that, get you either a goal or get you an assist in any given game. And that's his quality and that's why we bought him. So we need to see more of that. And I think the fact that you bought Anthony for the right and you got Marcus on the left, you know, Golden Bulls Marcus, he's going to be on the left, isn't he? That's his best position. That you, when they kind of flick it all round and move it all round and Bruno's on the right and you've got Veghorst doing other things, Sancho might then end up as your de facto 10 week to week. And I think he will play 10 at some point or for a period of time against Barcelona. He can he can expose Frankie. He can expose De Jong if De Jong is deeper because I think that that's what it's all about. It's about ball retention when you've got these kind of one-on-ones. Some stats for you. Just a, as a reminder. Mm. So on Sancho, 2019-2020 season, 20 goals and 20 assists in all competitions. In 2021, 16 goals and 20 assists in all competitions. And then he moved to Man United and his numbers drastically fell. So Rob, we, don't completely... think, we don't talk about that last bit. <laughs> but this is the this is the player that we're dealing with here. I'm seeing a lot yeah. of I saw um Adam McCola say that San like Saka and Sancho are not too far apart, or he maybe no. he went he wouldn't he wouldn't swap Saka for Sancho. And everyone's like, Oh, Sancho, Sancho's nowhere near Saka, he's nowhere near him, he's nowhere near him. And that might be true in this in the context of this season. However, when you talk about the numbers Sancho was putting up in the Bundesliga and you know how good he was then and why he cost 80 million in the first place. If he, if Eric Ten Hag can get those kind of numbers back, if Eric Ten Hag can get those kind of numbers back, we got a hell of a player on our hands. Absolutely. And I think this is the whole thing of why you bought Sancho. Like, I do think part of it is because he's English and at that time was in the England team and kind of rising star, that there's a lot of hype and bluster. And we talk about prices and what he's going to do in the future. But you can't predict the future, can you? You really just cannot. You just hope that you know what's going to happen. On that point there, you're like, I think Saka is an amazing footballer. I really do. I think he's a massive part of Arsenal's success. Obviously, I think why last year I said I think Arsenal could be title contenders this year because of the likes of Saka. I think when you look at Jaden Sancho, when you look at the DNA and profile of this Man United team playing 4-1-5, he is perfect for that five. He really is because you can play him in maybe three or four roles. There was a few minutes in the Leicester game where he was the number nine, just for a few minutes, where he played at the top end and the other players rotated around him and then they quickly swapped back. But that's what you need, isn't it, Scott? Fluidity. You need to be able to have players who have interchangeable mindsets for positions at the attack the days of being a nine and just standing there and waiting for the ball have gone. That's gone. It's the same as a number 10 being your trekarista. They have to do other stuff like work, press, overload in certain areas. All that stuff is modern tactics. It's really important. I think Jaden fits the bill for all of that. I think he's most dangerous in the centre because he can spot that pass because it's part of his game. The short game is what he does really, really well. I think at United, he could very easily be a 15 goal, 15 assist player, really easily, like with just tweaks, just getting to where he his spot, as we call it in basketball, where someone gets to their spot and every time they hit it, it just goes in the net. I think he could be that kind of player if you can rotate the attack around his talents. Do you know what? Like I looked again, I only quoted two seasons. He actually got 20 assists in all competitions in three consecutive seasons for Dortmund. He got, yeah, he got, he got like something like, before he came to United, he got like something 70 assists in 70 games or something. And it was like... As a stats per player, he was a stats monster in the Bundesliga, the best player in the league by miles in terms of his statistics. So that's what you were buying. It's very easy for United fans to maybe forget that because of the issues that he's had recently. But what you said again earlier on is completely right. Take him away, get his head straight, help him rather than hinder him and also take the pressure off him. And I think he looks completely different on the pitch. Like he looks like chest out, fun, enjoying the game. And just, just no pressure. And I think Ten Hag saying to him, go and be the best version of yourself that you can be. That is a cliche, but it's actually completely true. It worked for Marcus, hasn't it? 
It's worked for Jaden. Now it's going that way. And I think you could apply it to other players. And, you know, Aaron Wambasaka, maybe. Yeah. Luke Shaw, maybe. You know, there's other players, I think, who have gone up another level in the last few months because of that mantra. It works. Stick with it. I think Ten Hag said ahead of the Leicester game to Sky Sports about talking to Marcus Rashford when we met him. I want to see your teeth, (laughs) which is, I want to see you smile. And I think we're definitely getting that out of Marcus Rashford. And I think if we're, we're starting to see signs that maybe Sancho might be able to follow suit. And I think most United fans are being pretty confident that now things are starting to work, that Sancho will follow suit eventually. And if he does end up putting up a goal, a game or an assist, a game numbers for the rest of the season, that is a hell of a contribution moving forward. And I think also you've actually got to tell him that. And I think he probably has been told that. I think it's like, you know, we can help you do all these things. We will absolutely be subservient to your needs to make sure that you're in the best condition that you can be in. But we want a goal or an assist a game, Jaden. Now, footballers are all right with that generally. That's not pressure. That's just to go out there and be, you know, the best player you can be. So I think with Jaden Sancho, the fact that he's got someone like Marcus Rashford at the moment, who is an absolute killer in the middle, you know, coming from the left through the centre, everything he does is just like golden. That that form will fall off at some point, Scott. It can only fall off, you know, form of that quality. But what you can say to Jaden is, is work around Marcus, help him, help each other. Marcus gets an assist for any of the front four or five or six every week. He's doing his job, isn't he? And I think that he's more than capable of doing that. Still got a striker to add into this as well. You've not even bought your striker yet, have you? Like, we think about it in the future, you're probably going to have new players come in in the summer that can make this even better. So this is why if United can achieve this now, we don't need to talk about the Premier League title race. In six months or another year, you should be even better than where you are now. You should be really pushing towards the top or at least be within two or three points of it. You're already kind of five, six, seven points away from... An unbelievable achievement this season. We don't even don't even want to talk about it, do we? It's like you know the unspoken words of the title race. But Man United have done really well this year, and I think Eric Ten Hag and the players, all credit to them and all power to them because they have made it happen. We'll talk about the the squad and what how he lines up against Barcelona in a second. Mm. But I just wanted to point out something I'm not sure if has clicked with people yet. So Garnacho started the home game against Leeds. Sancho came on and scored. Sancho started the away game against Leeds. Garnacho came on and scored. Yeah. Garnacho started the home game against Leicester and Sancho came on and scored. Mm -hmm. So that's obviously be good if both players scored in each game, but it just goes to show that Eric Ten Hag really is starting to be able to deploy players and make them effective off the bench, which is something that we've never really been able to do. Yeah, look, I think it would have been really easy for the Leicester game to start Sancho and put Garnacho on the bench. But I think, again, when you look at this kind of, uh, you know, ladder of responsibility about who does what, he, he, Ten Hag's really clear that it doesn't ma- really matter about age. To him, it's about kind of your status in the squad. Like, if you've earned it, then you have it. Now, I wouldn't have started Garnacho against Leicester. I think that he is much more effective off the bench, like levels above from the bench than he is when he starts. It's much more easy to mark because of the way he plays the game. But I think when you look at this now, how beautiful is it that if you've got Jaden Sancho playing and for 60 minutes it's not worked for him, bring on Garnacho. Beautiful. Or if you start Garnacho and you've got Jaden on the bench, then you can completely flip the front four and have Jaden come on and run the game for you. Great options for Man United. Like you said, I don't think the squad is great. It's still getting there. They're good players in the squad. I think what we're seeing now is there may be more than 11 who are worth starting. And that's a huge thing for Ten Hag to be able to have maybe 12, 13, 14 in your rotation who are genuine first team starters rather than your Donny van der Beeks. Sorry, so, Donny. Bar- <laughs> Sorry, Donny. Donny is one of the players who's out for the rest of the season. Christian Eriksen's out for a little while yet. Yeah, Harry Maguire's picked up a recent injury. Mm. Anthony Martial, nobody really knows when he's coming back. Anthony, I don't think is too far away. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not going to say nearly a fully fit squad because that's a good few players who are out. But it's as bulky as it's been in a while, I want to say. Especially now, given we have not seen... Like we mentioned Marcel Sabitzer earlier. He's been brought in to fill Eriksson's role, yet Mm. has not yet played with Casemiro because one of them has been suspended. 
and, and hasn't played the number eight. He's played. The and he six. hasn't played the number eight yet. Yeah. At all. So I'm just I'm getting encouraged slowly. Do you think he will go against Barcelona? How do you think he'll go against Barcelona? Do you think he will line up that midfield as Casemiro Sabitzer, or is it going to be Casemiro Fred Sabitzer? What, what do you think is the most effective way to go about it? I, I think the Fred the Fred question is really pertinent in in this in, the, in what you're posing there is about what does he see maybe Fred's responsibilities, Fred's strengths, Fred's weaknesses. You know, what, how do you balance these things up? I think with what you've got and what you've got available, there's no doubt. Obviously, Casemiro the six because he's the best number six in the world. What function do you want from eight? Are you looking for just pure energy, some spoiling? some marking, some aggression, or are you looking for someone that can maybe do some of those things, but also have better passing, better range, more danger in the final third, and still have an engine? So you go with Sabitza, don't you? So I think actually Sabitza has shown in a very, very kind of small time space, so Man United fans, how good he really is. When we're doing shows on getting Sabitza, what we'll be getting all the time from people? Who? Who is this guy? He's at, Bas- he's at Bayern Munich, but I've never seen him play. It's like, well, you have seen him play. You know, he was captain at Leipzig and he's played a lot of games over the last few years and has got a kind of cult following. I think he's come to Man United and shown immediately in that midfield, Scott, what a kind of outwardly responsible footballer he is. Like, I like the way he plays the game. So I think, for me, if I'm picking the team, it's Casemiro and it's a, and it's, um, and it's a bit of playing the Ericsson role. And then you work the rest around it. So four one five, so bits are going forward and think. I would take Fred out because even though Fred was better again in the second half against Leicester, Fred is just like you know he's either terrible, he'll help you lose the game, or he's brilliant, it helps you win the game. I would rather have Fred on the bench as an impact player, like a bit like Garnacho, not put the responsibility on the player from the first whistle. That is how he was used, yes. actually, when he was probably at his most effective earlier in the season as well. Totally. Off the bench as energy and pressure. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, yeah. You know, straight in there, hurt, you know, get into tackles, especially if you're tired and you need someone to come in and help with that press and that 4-1-5. So you're right. Uh, and that's where I would like to see Fred continue. I don't really like Fred starting. I always kind of bite my lip and go... Needs must, you know, it's not my favourite thing in the world. But I think Sabitza, I'd like to already think that we could sign him for 10 million at the end of the season and just put him in a rotation. He doesn't need to be a starter every week. Him and Ericsson as rotating number eight between each other, say even at the end of the season, I already quite like that. I think Ten Hag likes that and thinks I will use that going forward. That will allow then Casemiro, my best, probably my best midfielder, and maybe my best player to be able to do all the things that he does really well from that kind of deeper role behind the press. And he can pick those passes out to maybe progressive number eights. I don't think Fred is particularly progressive. Did you see Eric Ten Hag pat Yuri Tielemans on the back the other day? Did I? No, I didn't. Did that happen? Was that, that a thing? It happen. It's been, it's been a social media thing. It's been made of a lot on Twitter. Uh, oh, well, all I've Yuri seen Tielemans on, is, is on the is side. On yeah. Eric Ten Hag just walks into shot and gives him a pat on the back. He doesn't even notice, but he's going on a free transfer this summer. So you're talking about Sabitzer for 10 million. Is Tielemans a potential alternative option? It's kind of nice, actually, to be talking about players for 10 million or free. <laughs> and you know what? That's why that old Fergie adage of there is no value in the market is a load of nonsense. There is value in the market. It's just that if you're willing to pay top dollar for rubbish footballers, there's no value in what you're doing. So Bits is a really good footballer. Tillemans, I suppose we'll talk about more about him more as he'll be a free agent. And I think obviously he'll have a ton of offers, won't he, in terms of getting out of Leicester and going to another club or a bigger club. Um I think his stock's fallen for the for all the right reasons. I think we're seeing the level of Tillemans, whereas I think before... 25. Huh? 25. He's young enough to carry on developing. And I think that he is, as a unit, really, really good at, again, certain things. I do question his desire quite a bit at Leicester. I think he kind of just... He's a bit hot and cold and always has been. And as a footballer, even before, before Leicester, he was kind of considered that kind of player. Um, I look at someone like Kobe Manu and I say to myself, right, whoever you sign has got to be better than that young lad. Yeah, because 
he's really, really good. And he's got all sorts of qualities that you can develop a bit like Garnacho. Why sign a left-sided player now? Because you've got Garnacho. You don't need to do that. So I think in midfield, you will sign someone. You'll obviously bring in maybe a Sabitzer. I'm not so sure about Tillemans. I think he would work on a, on a free transfer. He'd be on a big wage. You could develop him still. But would that then stop you, Scott, buying a better player? It might do. You know, there might be a midfielder out there for 40, 50, 60 million who is just twice the player that Tillemans is. I would also argue, though, that Tillemans, when he was playing well, was a 60, 70 million player. And his stock has only probably dropped because he's joined Leicester as a stepping stone club and been priced out of a move. And he was also playing the kind of 8-10 role rather than the 6-8 role. So if he plays like Man United, where I think our number eight has to do a lot of number six stuff, I don't think he's great at that. I think he's better player at the top end of the pitch. But if you're already filling that part of the pitch up with the Sanchos, with the Brunos, with the Rashfords, is there a space for a Tillemans or do you need more like a Sabitzer? So I think you probably need more of a Sabitzer to do more of the grafting role. I don't think Tillemans is a grafter, not at all. And I think that he would struggle with that. Good player, a really, really good free agent if you're going to bring him in. It was only five minutes ago, Scott. People talking about being 60, 70, 80 million. And I was like, no, no thanks. Good player. I, I wouldn't say no to him at Manchester United, but I don't think that he is kind of the perfect signing if you're looking to upgrade that midfield. Rob, anything? We'll, we'll maybe talk a little bit about Barcelona uh, if you if we feel like we've missed anything, but we could maybe also go into some comments from the last show. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Whichever you prefer. Let's uh, do it all. Let's do it all. Any final thoughts on Barca then? Barca are a really good team. I think we saw that in the game at the Camp Nou that they can take control of a match because they're that kind of side. They are Xavi's DNA flowing through the team. However, I do think the Man United are the better side. I think in terms of looking at the, the two 11s now, Barcelona losing their two kind of prodigal boys in the middle of the park, that is a problem for them. And you can see that their ball progression is not quite what it once was. Do you know what I mean? They're trying to do it, find their identity. And they've done really well in La Liga. I think that on a hot night at Old Trafford, where it's boiling point, I think Man United could take advantage of the crowd and the atmosphere and maybe and get through this game. Not comfortably. I think there will be some slip-ups, no doubt, along the way. But Man United have got all their artillery ready. Barcelona haven't. Let's go to some comments to finish up today. Uh, we'll do another show, obviously, on Friday. Maybe a little delayed because I'll be coming back from, uh, from Old Trafford and... Might just be a little bit delayed in recording, but hopefully Thursday night is a good night. Uh, let's have a look at some comments from the last show. Cyber Recluse saying, <laughs> too early to say Rashford is world-class. It's his first time in six years that he's been consistent. And regarding the Ballon d'Or shout, Kane, Osman, Salah have done more in bigger stages and more consistently. Not this year, they haven't. Like, Osman, yes, you know, but like Kane hasn't. I see, like, this shit, like... <laughs> We can argue that. You see, that's a football point to argue, isn't it? We can all argue that, but it's Marcus Ballon d'Or. That get the hashtag going. That's where we are. We just need to hope that Marcus sticks on this. But I think it'll be really tough for him to maintain this form to the end of the season. Aaron Pandy saying, "I'm quite enjoying Veghorst at ten. Barca didn't dare play through us. So those Bruno solo passes really kill our defensive shape." Hope he starts on the right again for the foreseeable, which he did on Sunday. If Bruno starts at ten. Oh, no, I'm, I'm even going back too far here. I'm going to move on to the next comment. <laughs> Another one from Cyber Recluse. A proven prolific forward, one versatile midfielder who can do both defensive actions and passing and a cover for Varane, and we're good to go for the league. My picks for the summer are Harry Kane, Caicedo, Zubamendi, and Urien Timber. Mm. Well, I think the Timber thing will almost definitely be relit. No doubt about it. You know, it's just, I, I, I think that he's a player that is in... Eric Ten Hag's long-term thoughts. And he is a player, I think, again, that would make you better, isn't it? This is the whole thing about players coming into the club. Can you develop them? Do they make you better? Will you win more football matches? That's got to be the criteria, isn't it? Um, I, th I think Harry Kane is going to be a really interesting one. I do think we will be talking a lot more about Harry Kane towards the end of the season. It's interesting what's going on at Tottenham, isn't it? We know what's happening with Conte at the moment. We know what's happening with their football club. If they do fail, there's more likely that Kane goes. But I also won't be surprised if he signs a new deal. I like, won't be 100% surprised. We're hearing a little bit of that. 
I think that's a little bit spin. But United are probably going to buy a centre forward at some point. But I'm still kind of feeling, Scott, that maybe buying a proper eight or someone who's a world class eight, you know, so you can put it next to your world class six. Wow, if you could do that, then you're going to go up levels. You're going to win games that you probably thought you wouldn't win last season. And you're going to be a more parity with City and, and all the other teams around there. Find your Odegaard. Go get your Odegaard. Find someone that will do that metronomic play from the back and do it well every week. And if you compare them with Casemiro, you're, you're, you're dancing, you're singing. And I think that's where Ericsson is so big because Ericsson's helped United do that this year, hasn't he? Even though he's not a kind of traditional number eight. On that note, uh, there's no better Aaron Pandy again. There is no better ball carrier in world midfield than Frankie de Jong. And he's as quick as Dembele at Barcelona, deceptively quick. Loves yeah. to take the responsibility to carry the ball from defence to attack. That doesn't mean he's a six. Still needs Casemiro next to him. Frankie is a niche midfielder that could do it all. We had one player with a similar or better profile in Paul Pogba. Yes, that, 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 that's that's the perfect comment, you know, because I think this is the thing about Pogba, about how we've used him in, in years gone by. There's no doubt that I think he needs to take responsibility of his performances. So when he didn't play well, I think that's on him. However, there is no doubt there is a load of statistical information out there that shows that when you played Pogba in the correct positions, he was actually really, really good. And when you played him in the bad ones, he was bad. So I think it's the same with De Jong, isn't it? That if you wanted De Jong to be your number six, say for the whole season, you're probably going to concede goals just the way it is. He's not going to be able to do that function as well as, say, Casemiro. Um, I don't know if there's a better player out there who does the 6-8 function better than De Jong and can link with the attack. But I do also think there's a ton of players out there we haven't really talked about in that position. There are a lot of midfielders, I think, with, who can play that role in the system. Sabitzer is one of them. Sabitzer is someone who was brilliant pre-Bayern Munich. Really, really great footballer. Incredible XG for a midfielder who can help you at the top end of the pitch and do all the running around, all the Fred bits, all the McTominay bits. So do not be surprised if we go into next season with Sabitzer being a signing and Sabitzer being a starter. I think he is good enough at, was he, 28, 29? So, I think he's about to turn 30. Yeah, so, so he's not, a bit like Casemiro, he's not old, he's not ancient, but players change, don't they, as they get through their 30s. About to turn 29. Yeah, he, he might be a better player. He might actually be suitable for that role. And therefore, you can then go and throw all your eggs in one basket and go and buy a big-time striker. I've also just seen a picture of Sabitzer with short hair, which has really freaked me out. Uh, oh, I don't like that. I don't. I, 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 I like his look. I like his look. I think he, you know he's, a, he's kind of got got warrior look in the middle of that midfield. Uh, I'll run through two more comments. Uh, one from Kyle. All Eric Ten Hag needs is some more key ingredients, and he'll be cooking up some Michelin star stuff with firework emojis, and Mayhar as well. Saying another positive show. Reading more headlines about Dybala for next season. I've not seen these. Uh, can see Ten Hag utilizing him like he did with Tadic at Ajax. Who do you think United are likely to sign and why? It's really like, I know this sounds like sitting on the fence and it is sitting on the fence to a level, but it's about, you know, what, what happens for the rest of the season. This will dictate what happens in the market next year. I think kind of when you look at it, there are, there are key questions for me. How good are you at the end of the season with the striker? Because it might be that Marcus is suddenly a number nine and he's brilliant, or maybe Martial comes back and he's brilliant. So you're not talking about striker as much. What do you do with Bruno Fernandes? Are you playing as a 10? Do you want him in wider roles? That's a big question. And then when you look at the midfield, it's who plays with Casemiro. I think the, a bigger question on top of that then for maybe the defence is do you go and get rid of the Chuckle Brothers? I think that is possible what might happen. And you bring in a right-sided centre-back to kind of work with the team. You've got someone there who can do that function for Varane. And then maybe possibly a right-back if you're not happy with Aaron Wan-Bissaka. But all these things are moving, aren't they, Scott? We can't predict them at the moment because they're actually working quite well. So when things are working well, be positive about it. Be happy about it. We don't have to think too far in the future. When we get to those junctures, we can jump those hurdles then. I do think United will look for a big-time striker at some point, a Kane, an Osserman. It might not be one of them. You might go get someone that's more of a development striker. You know, like we've talked again about Sesco. Like, Sesco's still only, what, 12 years old? Something like that. He's still, a, he's still a baby boy. Yeah, you might say, we'll put some money in him because in two or three years' time, he might be as good as Haaland. That might be the gamble you take in your development if you do it at kind of a good pace. You might say, I don't want Harry Kane. He's too old at that, at that point. So there's so much thing, things to come. 
hopefully all good. But we always know with football, it's kind of it can kick you where it hurts, kind of in the proverbials. Let's hope Man United can carry on this form. If they carry on this form, Scott, we will be title contenders next year. Be absolutely 100% sure about it. And that's before we talk about transfers. Talking of kick you in the nether regions, uh, we haven't mentioned much of the ownership today, but there are suggestions that the Glazers are looking for outside investment. There is a party uh, uh, that are willing to facilitate that. We have also seen Liverpool say yesterday that they are not, the Liverpool owners are not going to sell and instead they are looking for outside investment. So it's not completely off the table that they stay. I said it last week on the show. It's exactly what I said. We, we know that the Glazers are looking potentially for that minority-majority p- uh, partnership with a firm or with someone, a hedge fund. So we, we know all about these guys in America, former AC Milan owners, been in football, in and out around different sports, very, very well known, probably already connected to the Glazers in terms of their business models and who they are. And I do think that as much as the Glazers would love £7 billion to get out of town and they would do that, I don't know if anyone's going to give them that, even the Qataris. So, you know, just to kind of touch on that as well a little bit about the ownership of Man United fans again, Twitter has been a completely toxic place the last week. Some of the stuff coming out of fans is so, so awful. If you want to do that and that's what you want to do, good on you. That's up to you, isn't it? You know, United accounts called United123 with a picture of a footballer. Great. Have your say. But I think when it comes to the Glazers, let's not trade one evil thing for another or one bad thing for another. We don't want to do that, do we? So I actually think the Glazers might stick around, Scott. I know like when we've had these conversations, kind of had differences of opinion on things. I think the Glazers would like a way to remain. Like they've got this manager now who's quite good and the team's starting to win and they might be going... Might be able to skim the top off a little bit more. Yesterday, a price hike in tickets for the first time in 11 years, 5% on tickets. My season ticket just went up. You can kind of see a business model being established here. Like, why would the Glazers do that if they were leaving? That's a problem, isn't it? Why would you announce a price rise? So, you know, if you're getting out of town when a new owner might not want that. Let's see what happens. We do know that Ratcliffe wants a club. We know that Qatar wants a football club. I think we're going to have to kind of wait and see if a proper big, huge bid comes in to push the Glazers out of town. Yeah, I think the bids that went in on Friday were opening bids. Opening bids and normal. That's completely normal in this situation to to put a a kind of teaser bid in and say, we would like to do this. We kind of know that Jim Ratcliffe will probably have the most, most structured bid in terms of his business with Ineos. And we know that probably the filthy rich bid will come from Qatar because they've got additional cash. But I'm not sure about the Glazers. Like, I think they're playing with us all as well. I think that they want to drive the share price up. I think they've always wanted to do that. And guess what? It's worked. Share price has doubled in the last few months. So they know what they're doing by putting a lot of things out into the media and the press about how they want to sell. Do they really want to sell? Yes, for the right price. But they're not going to leave town for like, two and a half billion or walking out just go oh we'll just take our money and run uh, I think it's going to be more twists and turns before we see the the resolution of this ownership battle and story plenty more of that to come I will wrap up for today because Barcelona are on the horizon we've broke that down a little bit for you I think Rob and I are both pretty confident that United can do it if they don't, it's not the end of the world. There's a cup final on Sunday to come as well. At Wembley will be back on Friday afternoon to look ahead to that and look back at the Barcelona game as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, any final thoughts, Rob? No, I think what Eric will be saying to the team going ahead of Barcelona, to his players, and this is all kind of, again, blue skies and confidence building. If you go and beat Barcelona at Old Trafford, say you beat them really well. Say like you beat them 2-3-4-0, something amazing. What an amazing shot in the arm to take to Wembley to say to Newcastle United, who've got a few injuries and a few problems and starting their form to slide just slightly. Hey, you're going to beat us? We just went and smashed the team at the top of La Liga and we're kind of back to who we think we are in terms of our heads up here. Marcus pointing to his head, all the players pointing to their head. You're going to say to Newcastle, rise to the challenge. I'm sure Newcastle will. But I think Newcastle's form has slightly dipped. You can take advantage of that by beating Barcelona, get inside their heads and show that you're the better team. I think we all believe that we're better than Newcastle, don't we? But at the same time, Newcastle, they want this trophy to validate their project. 
with the Saudi investment. So it's an interesting little chess match. I think Man United have got the advantage going in to these two matches. But don't lose to Barcelona because then that's a difficult one, isn't it? You've got to go to, to Wembley and just build yourself up again and say, right, we are worthy of what people think we are. Go be your best version of yourself at Old Trafford. I hope the fans, everyone enjoys it on Thursday night. It'll be a cracking atmosphere one way or the other. And if the fans get on it with the players, then you can beat Barcelona. Absolutely. That's it from us today. Like I say, we'll be back on Friday. You can subscribe in the meantime to the show wherever you get your pods. Apple, Google, Spotify, and all the major podcast platforms. We drop the show twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays, and we're on YouTube as well. So head over to that channel. Like this video, leave a comment for us. Subscribe as well if you haven't already. We'd love you to join the community, so please do. And get in touch with us on Twitter, but be nice, obviously. Uh, at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore P, and at Promise Land MU for the show as well. We'll see you on Friday for another Promise Land. Thanks for listening.